Yeah, I, I, uh, I've been in the animation business for about 30 years now. Um, back when I started in animation, um, there was two schools. Uh, Sheridan College in Canada, where I went, and CalArts in Valencia were the two school animation schools where you could learn traditional, hand-drawn, classical, Disney-style animation. And they were both set up by Disney, I believe. Um, now there's something in, in the States, there's something of four, over 400 schools teaching animation. So obviously they're not um, teaching students who aren't getting jobs. Back when I started, there was, there was no CG animation. There was no, all special effects were, were done with practical models. Explosions weren't done with particle systems on computers. Um, it was the infancy of, of CG uh, coming out of uh, New York Institute of Technology where, where a lot of that art was developed. Um, I worked on various TV shows up in Canada as an animator. I was in school for, I think, uh, three years. They didn't offer a Bachelor of Arts program, but they do now. Um, I came down to the States on a, an O-1 visa in 1994 to work for Walt Disney Company as an animator on their feature films. Um, I came in, I think, at the absolute crest of the wave, the second wave of animation. They, they kind of call it the second golden age of animation. Um, films like Little Mermaid came out, sort of resurrected uh, Disney feature animation, because they were the only company doing feature animation at that time. DreamWorks didn't exist. Um, and um, what was the other film? It was Little Mermaid. It was uh, Before Lion King. It was Beauty and the Beast. These films were making huge box office. I believe Beauty and the Beast was actually nominated for Best Picture when it came out. Um, I think that was the last film. Uh, actually, Up, I think, was actually uh, nominated as Best Picture. But it will never, they will never have another Best Picture that's animated because they've changed the whole thing. Now there's a Best Animated Picture. But um, I started on Hunchback of Notre Dame. And right after I started there, uh, Lion King came out. And Lion King was an absolute phenomenon. Nobody knew it was going to do that. Just like any film, you don't know it's going to be a blockbuster. But it was massive. I believe it made, with uh, consumer products and stuff, it made well over a billion dollars. These things were, were absolutely massive. I think out of the top 50 grossing movies of all time, 10 of those are animated, um, you get 20%. And of all those other 50 movies, in the top 50 grossing movies, all of them are extremely heavily uh, visual effects based movies. Avatar, which is, I think, had over 900 effect shots, and a lot of that is animation. Um, whether it's motion capture animation or keyframe animation, um, the Lord of the Rings series, massively animated. Um, so it's a, it's a huge business, and uh, it's, a, it's a fun business at times for people like me who, who do the art part of it. Um, it's it's incredibly hard work. It's very time consuming. It's literally frame by frame filmmaking. I'm sure all of you have seen how this stuff is made. Um, also, back when I started animation, there were, there were no video games. I think the video games were Pong. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I had any animation in it. Um, Galaxians or something, you know. It was just moving a little spaceship on the bottom and shooting things. Now, um, the the video game industry, I believe in 2007, outstripped box office receipts in films. It's massive. I think that the, um, the biggest opening day, I believe, for, a, for a, um, a film up to this date was, I think, Spider-Man 3 when it came out. And it made 59 million opening day, which was massive. It's, you know, um, Grand Theft Auto 4, the video game, made 310 million at its first day of sales. These things are huge and massive amounts of animation in those too. So you have feature films that still employ uh, a lot of people in, in uh, 
a lot of people in, in animation here in, in LA. Um, television went overseas for animators years and years ago. Um, it went over to Korea and Japan. Japan became too expensive, so they started sending it to Korea. Korea is now getting more expensive, so I think they're sending it to Somalia or um, some some little island that drifts down the Amazon or something. I think there's cheap labor there now too, so that, that's where it's going. But um, um, we're we're looking at at opportunities for animators in the business of animation in in theaters around that I was never weren't around when I was there. So people say, where's where is, um, what is the future? Where, where is animation going? It's going to India. <laughs> it's all going to India. Um, they, outsourcing is a, is a huge uh, issue for everybody in the film industry. We don't really have any um, incentives here to keep the business here. And in a lot of ways, it's just like making toasters or anything else. If you can make a toaster for $12 instead of $40, you're going to send it to be made for twelve dollars. Even if it's a slightly inferior product, people will buy a twelve-dollar toaster before they buy a forty-dollar toaster or whatever. So, um, to a huge degree, as animators, as the artists, you have to keep moving. You have to be versatile. You have to keep your passport up to date. Um, <laughs> most of the people I've worked with over the years have worked in at one time in Ireland, in London in Spain, in Paris, in uh, Australia, New Zealand, the Philippines. Most of, the, most of my people that I worked with in Canada had to go to uh, Korea to work as overseas directors and that sort of thing. And they all came back with Korean wives too, which I thought was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> they call it yellow fever or something. <laughs> Animators are generally a pretty homely bunch, so the girls would look at them and they'd immediately marry them. So. Um, but uh, it's still, it's still um, something you have to consider uh, moving around. You have to be willing to, to, um, to move to other countries. Um, wherever the work is, you have to go. Or you know, if you're lucky enough to get into one of the big studios like DreamWorks, Disney, Sony, Warner Brothers, um, that's great because you, are, you have health care. But um, you have free lunches at DreamWorks. <laughs> I notice the people at DreamWorks are getting bigger. I don't know. There's, there's got to be some sort of correlation there. But um, I've been freelancing for the past 10 years since I left Disney in 2001. There was a major shift at Disney in the late 90s um, from traditional hand-drawn animation to computer-based animation. And there was huge layoffs. Um, a lot of people had a hard time transitioning from something that they had done since they were a child. Uh, drawing came nat very naturally to a lot of the people. The whole history of that company's um, image was based on, to a huge degree, it was based on animation. That's what made that company what it is. It drives consumer products. Um, it drives the theme parks. And all of a sudden, it was... Um, it was no longer um, marketable in a lot of people's minds because of movies like Toy Story that were pushing the boundaries of, of I would think that was the first feature length CG um, movie. And it was, frankly, it was a stunning, it was a stunning movie because the story was so fantastic. You know, the characters were great fun to watch. It really didn't have that much to do with the fact that it was it was CG. I mean, I think that film would have done well in any any medium because it was it was a wonderful story with great characters, but it shifted people's expectations of what they wanted to see. Reflections, the backgrounds were amazing looking. Um, it made a lot of money, and that's the bottom line. Um, money talks, and everything else is is ridiculous. So. Uh, there was a shift, and a lot of people got laid off, got let go. It was a horrible working environment there at the time. And uh, the profitability of a lot of the traditionally hand-drawn films was going down. The writing was on the wall. You had, to, you had to switch to CG, or you were going to be unemployed. You had to move to television. So since then, 
um, the films have been 95% CG. Huge, huge change for artists to, uh, to keep up with. And it continues to change, although there's, there's so much work out there in, in arenas that didn't exist. Uh, like I said, video games. There's still a lot of work in television, although it's all pre-production work. All the, all the um, work in animation is done overseas. Is that going to happen with feature films? Yeah, you bet it is. Sure it is. I mean, it's like saying um, we're not going to, you know, we're just going to build cars here. We're not going to, we're not going to build cars anywhere else. We're not going to build them in Mexico. Or we're not going to build them in Japan or China. The work goes to where the, to where the labor force is the cheapest. And India's got it. India's got the perfect, the, it's the perfect storm. Uh, they have a massively um, educated workforce. Um, they all speak English. Um, they're highly motivated. They're very quick learners. Uh, they work for a quarter, average of a quarter of what the artists here work for. Um, Disney uh, direct-to-video animation is all done in India now. Pre-production is done here in Burbank or in Glendale, but all of their animation is done over there. And instead of three or four years to teach an animator here, they, they give the people over there six months to learn. So these guys pick it up quickly. Um, the, the level of the art and the level of the acting is not there yet, but it will be. It will definitely be. These, these guys are averaging, you know, they're, they're 25 years old. Most of these guys are younger and they're hungry, they're fast. Um, and they will, they will be doing, I think, feature quality work within conservatively five years. Something that took this country to develop since the 1930s. They're picking up on so fast. They have, they have the tools. Um, so it's inevitable that, that features will go over there, just like feature films have gone to Romania or wherever, wherever they can get the best uh, bang for their buck, that's where it's going. Um, let's see what else. Um, looking at, um, that's where I think it's going. I mean, I think it's, it's definitely going overseas. So what do you do? How do you, um, how, as an artist, how do you cope with where it's going? You, well, there's a few things. I think you um, keep your passport up to date, keep a, have a good set of luggage, uh, <laughs> or you can join the military, marry a rich person, uh, you know, win a lottery, yeah, whatever. So I don't, I don't think there's any fighting it. Um, but as a as an artist in, in the business, um, just give you a little rundown of what it's like to work at the sharp end of the sword of, of the film business. Um, you typically are either a freelancer or you get on staff. You get cast a character. Say uh, you're working on Aladdin and you draw women well, you'll get jazz when you start animating your scene. You show it to your lead animator. There's usually a, a for each character on a film, there is a certain person who's cast as the lead on that, on that character. And you show that, that scene to them, you animate it, you spend a week, 10 days, depending on the length of the scene, animating in your room, you show it to them. If they like it, you take it to the director, they look at it, they approve the shot, you tie it down, you send it back in, you do your next one. This is a, um, a process that goes on for the average film is over a year, sometimes a year and a half, sometimes two years of steady work. The last three to four months, if it's a fairly well-organized production, is crunch time, which means you're working 60, 70, 80 hour weeks, seven days a week for three or four months on end. Creates a lot of uh, stress, divorces. Uh, in a lot of cases, if you are salaried, you don't get paid overtime, and that's become more and more commonplace now. So you may be working making a decent salary, but if they're doubling the amount of hours you're doing per week, you're making half of what you, what you actually would be making. And um, I remember 
going up to Pixar to visit some friends up at Pixar, and they had just finished working on The Incredibles, which was an awesome film. And I noticed that everybody, almost every single person in there was walking around with a wrist brace on. You know, they all had carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, these people were actually injuring themselves to make a film, which I thought was outrageous. But, you know, they all got over it and got their operations <laughs> or whatever, and they were happy to work on the next one. So, um, in television, it's quite different. You have a very, very short schedule. Um, television shows are generally storyboarded here, written here. Pre-production is done here, and then it's all sent overseas, and it's a very fast turnaround. It's uh, people generally don't stay in television animation for more than a few years, and then they're just they're burnt out. They have to do something else. Um, it's steady work, but it's it's really tough. It's it's a lot of it's a lot of work, a lot of hours. The average person is working six days a week, and most people that I know in the animation industry are taking the work home and working at night at home, too. So um, it's, they're a lot like school teachers, I guess, that way. Um, there's video games. Like I said, is, has got a, a um, makes massive, massive amounts of money. These things are, are ju absolute juggernauts. And they're getting bigger and bigger. And they're getting more uh, cinematic, which means more animation. Um, generally, the workforce in computer games is younger. Um, they're hungry. They love video games. They, they want to get into a company. Um, a lot of the companies have very lax um, policy when it comes to how you can dress and you can go in. You, a lot of these guys look like they just came off a skateboard park, you know, and they love it because, uh, you know, they're young. You can listen to music all day. They have uh, free soda, ping pong tables. <laughs> and for that, you get, you get 70, 80 hour weeks. Um, very little bargaining power. Most uh, effects places are not unionized. And the turnover rate is horrendous. Even for guys that are 22, 23 years old, find they can't uh, put up with that pace for more than a couple of these games. Uh, in the production end. If you get out of the production end and do pre-vis or something in post, it isn't as bad. But um, being the actual artist working on the games, it's tough. It's really, really tough. Um, visual effects industry. Um, like I said top 50 films, they're all, they're all Avatar, um, Titanic. 900 to 1,000 shots, visual effects shots per movie. These are bid, you bid to the studio on these shots. The studio can change their mind as much as they want. You have no choice. We'd like to see this whole shot from a slightly different camera angle. You know, go back and redo the shot. And we want it now. This is a normal thing that takes place. Um, James Cameron started a, a visual effects house um, back in the 90s called Digital Domain. They became the biggest uh, effects house in the industry. Um, he got out of it because he couldn't make money. He got out of visual effects because he couldn't make money. The margin was like 5% or something. Massive amounts of shots, very little return on the investment. Um, and he's a, clever, he's a very clever guy. Disney bought DreamQuest Images, shut it down. They couldn't make money off of it. Um, again, very little bargaining power for visual effects houses. I've worked for three of them, they all shut down. Really hardworking people, but you just, it's almost impossible to make money at it. Um, but it's such a sexy business, doing explosions and, and monsters and stuff, and you know, giant robots. You know, everybody who has a computer at home can get one of these animation programs and do this stuff. So those are guys you're bidding against. You're bidding against three kids in a garage with no overhead. Um, you can't, you can't do that. And increasingly, uh, visual effects are being done overseas because it's cheaper. So visual effects has generally, from the people that I've dealt with, has been a, has been a monetary dead end, um, which is funny because they, those films are all the big box office hits. 
you know, and they're and they're seventy percent visual effects or seventy percent animation. Um, so, you know, I know I've painted an extremely rosy picture of the business. <laughs> It can be fun. Animation, animators are generally um, people that, at a young age, figured they didn't want to get a real job. So um, they're like anyone else who loves what they do. And if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. It's, it's, uh, it can. I still think it's better than 99% of the jobs out there. It, you're working with great people, really fun people, motivated people, highly creative, completely insane. A lot of them. Very irresponsible. Uh, some of the stuff that goes on in studios, uh, you know, throwing eggs off the top of the buildings and you know, paper airplane contests. Uh, a lot of animators are like are are they're like children creating things. I mean, the great thing about animation is is you're taking a blank sheet of paper in front of you. There's nothing there when you start. There's absolutely nothing there. You have a voice of a character that they recorded for you. But you're starting with nothing, every, pretty well every day. There is nothing on the table. And it's, it's just what's in here and what's right here. You create a performance. Anything you've seen, any, you know, any of your favorite movies, all the movies you grew up with as kids, um, those came from literally nothing. And that's the really great thing about animation is, is you, can, you get to play God in a way. You, you, take, you take a pencil and paper and you you make Daffy Duck, you know? Daffy Duck is just as alive as any actor. We all know exactly who he is. He's famous all over the world. Um, you know, Captain Hook from Peter Pan. Um, they live, these things live. You're, you're, you know, animation is, is the illusion of life, you know, or and for animation is the delusion of life. But um, there is no, there is no uh, fame and fortune in animation. Um, nobody knows who we are. We create some of the most beloved performances that everybody remembers from childhood. Uh, animation has this amazing ability to, a lot of it is timeless. Um, people, I remember at, at Disney at one point, we said, geez, you know, we're talking about Dumbo. Everybody remembers Dumbo. A wonderful scene with his mother rocking under her. In her, uh, when she got put in jail for uh, beating somebody up or something. You know, it made people cry. And people always remember it. So, you know, wouldn't it be great to make a film like Dumbo? And uh, one of the studio executives said, well, no, we can, you know, you couldn't sell that film now. You couldn't sell it. And I go, can you explain to me then why when you put it out on DVD, you make, you make hundreds of millions off of it? You know, because it's timeless. These, the, those films that were made back in the 1940s, 1950s, they will sell in whatever format it happens to be, whether it's a chip implant or whatever, they will sell 100 years from now because they're timeless, great stories. Um, a lot of live action feature films may not have that appeal. Maybe it's because kids don't see them when they're really little. You know, That's one great thing about animation. We can, animated movies sell, sell consumer products like mad. I mean, they're, pillowcases and, and plush toys and, and posters. It's, it's off the charts with animation, which is great. Um, another great thing for, uh, for the business end of, of animation is that you don't have to pay your artists any residuals, which is great. The voice people, they come in for about a week, do their voice, and then they go away, and you get residuals. You know, the guys that are sitting there actually creating the characters and, and working for you and after you, they get nothing. You know, they get their salary and, and the joy of having worked on something. But there is, there is no, unless you create your own content. If you're like Seth MacFarlane, you create a uh, family guy or, or uh, American Dad. You know, that's the thing to do. You know, I mean, all these guys, all these people I know, they, they draw their whole lives, they draw for somebody else, they draw for the studios. Um, they always come up with ideas. If you can sell your own idea, you're set. You know, you're set. It's a, it's a, great, it's a great thing to do. It's, and Seth has been extremely successful at it. Um, let's see, what else have we got? Anybody remember Ren and Stimpy? 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, was, that was a fun project to work on. It was like 1990, I think. But that was interesting because the fellow who created that, John Chris Felici, was a Canadian guy. I actually played darts with his dad up in Ottawa at one point. But, um, he came up with that idea and he actually sold it to Nickelodeon. He had to sell it to Nickelodeon to get it made, but he really wanted to get that on screen. And he would, he would uh, do the storyboards, get Nickelodeon to look at them and approve them, and he would take them back and completely change them. So when he finished the show, when the show came out, the show was, the show was brilliant. I mean, it was just groundbreaking, ridiculously hilarious stuff. And, and Nickelodeon would look at it and go, what the hell is that? You know? <laughs> Meanwhile, they were, they were going through the roof. They were the top, it was a top show, you know, top cartoon. And, and so they, they didn't know what to do. They wanted control. They wanted to control this guy, but he couldn't be controlled. And, and the show was doing so well. What do you do with a guy who's a complete maverick, but his shows are doing great? You know, you kind of, you know, you close your eyes and hope for the best. Well. He overstepped his bounds a little bit too far and eventually pulled the show from him and destroyed it. But when we were working on that show, that was the closest we came to being minor, really minor celebrities. We could go to any college campus and get beers bought for us, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> you guys do Ren and Stimpy? Yeah, it was, you know, I, I can still, I, I'll go into a bar now and I'll do a napkin drawing of, of Ren or Stimpy and, and people just flip out. Which is, which is cool, because you usually don't get that, you know? <laughs> um, I go in and draw the hunchback, and I'm like, what the hell is that? <laughs> Red and Stimpy, or, or like Daffy Duck, or Porky Pig, or something like that. It's just, you know, everybody loves that stuff, you know? It's, it's ridiculous fun, it's silly, it's, 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 an, it's, an, it's a completely retarded way for a 50-year-old guy to make a living. I mean, I gotta say it. <laughs> I was, sitting there, I was sitting there last night at like 2 or 2 o'clock in the morning, and I hate to say it, and it's, it's, it's incredibly embarrassing, but I was, I was running Smurfs. <laughs> I was running Smurfs. Uh, Sony is, Sony's, putting out a, uh, Sony's putting out a feature, Smurfs feature. Yeah. Next is probably Strawberry Shortcake. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, like, I'm sitting there, and, I'm and these Smurfs are on the page. They're literally... Because I pulled out my ruler and I measured them, they were they were an average of inch to an inch and a half high, and there was there was seven of these little elves. <laughs> <laughs> there was seven of these little elves, and uh, all of them have to be moving. And uh, you know, there's moments like that you just you shake your head and say, "What the hell am I doing?" You know, but it's it's been uh, what have I been doing? You know, I say I, I was going to come up here and say hi. I'm, my name is Jamie, and I'm, I'm a recovering animator. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in it for 30 years. I've been trying to get out of this business for 30 years. Um, and I remember when I when I left Disney, uh, I was there from '94. I came down right after the earthquake, and that should have been like a warning. So that should have been the first red flag. But I came down right after the earthquake, and I worked from 94 to 2001 at Disney Feature Animation. And I trained on CG, and then I left. And when I left, I had to go in and get all my scenes that I had animated from Hunchback, Hercules, Mulan, Fantasia 2000, uh, Emperor's New Groove, all these different films. and. I got all my scenes and I put them on a reel and I looked at it and it was like a minute and a half. <laughs> I, was like, I was so depressed. <laughs> this, is, this is like seven years of my life is a minute and a half of screen. It was probably wasn't even a minute, it was probably 14 seconds. <laughs> but it was, you know, some of the scenes I was really happy with and maybe someday somebody will go back and, and look at them and, and go, wow, man, that's so awesome, but probably not. Um, <laughs> But it was, it was a, an eye-opener to me. It was, it was uh, this is what I've been toiling at you know, for, for years, and this is what I have to show for it. To me, it's like, this is such a pitifully small amount of work, but that is, that's animation. It's a massive amount of work for a huge amount of people. And you look at the credit lists on any feature, you know, you look at the credit list of something like The Incredibles, there's a, there's 800 to 1,000 people working on these things to put them out. Um, 
I always liked looking at the credits they have now, which, which didn't exist before, it's like production babies, you know? And in animation, I, I was like, uh, I think it was up or something, it was like 50 or 60 kids born, I go, who's impregnating these women? It's not the animators, they're at work the whole time. <laughs> some, of these, some of these babies are not theirs, you know? So, um, <laughs> schools, oh yeah, because schools. Talk about schools a little bit. Uh, the cost of getting a, a BA, now they offer a BA in animation at, at uh, CalArts. It's four year course and it's about $150,000 for the course. So um, you'll be paying off some debt there. There's another, there's actually a really interesting online school now. It's called Animation Mentor, started by some guys at Pixar. And you do all of your work online, and they have all the top animators. A lot of them are involved in this, and it's all online in the evening. They'll critique your work. So you're getting, you're getting critique and teaching from some of the best people in the business. And I think that's an 18-month course, and it's, and it's something like $17,000. It's a complete, it's an, it's an amazing bargain. I would, I would say to anyone who's stupid enough to get an animation to to look into something like that because that's a, that's a, it's an amazing uh, bargain um, I wish that had existed when I was when I went to school because I think it's uh, um, oh versatility um, for an artist I think for any artist no matter what business they're in I'd say to you know know your craft draw paint sculpt um, now you have computer programs to learn. Uh, learn everything you can about pipeline, uh, production, um, you know, how they distribute these things, you know. Um, every aspect of it, the modeling, the rigging. Um, now in CG, there's, there's a whole different pipeline now. Um, you're animating in, in CG, it's like you're animating in a puppet. You end up, there's a, there's a character that's standing there like this. And you've got, a, you've got probably, on average, I'd say seven, 800 controls for that puppet. So every, every fingertip has to be moved. You have to move all of these things to put this character in his, his first pose. That may take a minute, or it may take you an hour and a half to do that first pose. That's one frame. Now you've got possibly seven, 800 of those frames to do for, for an average scene. Um, People say, they always say, oh, you work in animation, so that's all computer now, right? And you go, yeah, you know, it's, there's a lot of computer. And I say, it's, it's really cool though, because you go up to your computer, right? And you go, animate. <laughs> and you look at it and nothing happens. You, know? so if you, see, you, you can look at that thing all day and it's not gonna do anything. Um, has it made animators' jobs easier? In some ways, yeah, it'll fill in. So uh, in between frames for you, but you usually have to massage those two. Um, it's taken the drawing element out of it. Um, the ability to draw was paramount before, and it's it's really it's taken that out. But you still have to have an artistic eye. You still have to do be able to do visual shorthand. You know, is is this is this clear or is that clear? You know, you're still acting. You're still you still have to look at uh, Chaplin and then Keaton and. Uh, and that sort of thing to, to understand how it is to emote and, 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 and make people react. So that's still there. Um, it's taken a lot of the joy out of, out of sharpening a pencil and, and being loose and, and flipping pages and stuff and then grabbing the stack of pages off your disc and flipping them and seeing this little thing come to life in front of you. Um, that's still there in, in computers, but not to the same degree. Um, it's made um, our job in one way really, really frustrating. Before, when you were animating on paper, you animated to a fixed camera. In CG, that camera can move as much as somebody wants it, so, but you're still acting to a camera. So all your, all your animation is to that camera. So the director or someone decides that they want, I'd like to see it, can I see it from over here? And they move the camera. 
you're, re you're reanimating that scene because you acted to hear and now he wants it to hear. So it isn't simple. And because it's computer, you can change anything. So a lot of directors want everything changed. Whereas before, they, they took pity on you, and, and if they wanted you to, <laughs> to fix something, they knew that this poor son of a bitch has to go back to his room and reanimate this thing. And they felt really bad about making you do that. So if, unless it was something that really didn't work, they said, can you fix, just tweak this little part here, and you usually could fix it in a day. Uh, working on, um, what was it? Uh, the Garfield movie. I don't know if anybody saw that one. Hopefully you didn't see that one. <laughs> but I remember I had this scene of the, of the big, stupid, fat, orange cat running after the truck or something. And I had been animating for 25 years, so I knew what I was doing. And it was like a three-second scene. And the director didn't like the way the cat's tail was moving. Mm. Can you make it less shock absorbery and, and more, I don't know what the hell the word was, but I, I didn't understand what he was saying, but I worked on that scene for three weeks straight, showed it half a dozen times, and he kept looking at this damn tail. You know? So that kind of thing happens, you know, it happens all the time, and that has made our job a lot more difficult because there's, there's a word for it, you can fill it in, the initials are FF, and it's frame, <laughs> and that's what that's what we end up dealing with a lot. You can you can massage and tweak and call for unbelievable amounts of changes because it's the computer, and the computer does all the work. So.